Hello, everyone. I'm Lana Zak. Thank you so much for joining me. Judge Amy Coney Barrett finished taking questions from senators on Wednesday. After three days of hearings before the Senate Judiciary Committee, Republicans are pledging to see her nomination through, all but guaranteeing Barrett's appointment to the Supreme Court. But that did not stop lawmakers from pressing her on several key issues, including abortion rights, health care, immigration, and the right to vote. CBS News Chief Congressional Correspondent Nancy Cordes is on Capitol Hill with the very latest. Welcome back. Thank you, Senator. With her confirmation in sight, Judge Amy Coney Barrett was even more cautious today, declining to weigh in on everything from the constitutionality of Medicare. It's not a question that I've ever considered before. To the validity of mail-in voting. Um, that's a matter of policy on which I can't express a view. To me, that just feels like a fundamental part of our democracy. Democrats tried unsuccessfully to divine her views on voter discrimination. Voting discrimination exists based Senator, on race in America in any form. I'm not going to express an opinion because these are very charged issues. The 48-year-old appeals court court judge so did try to reassure her opponents on uh, one front, Obamacare. I think you're suggesting that I have some hostility to the ACA, which I assure you that I don't. They so didn't buy it. Respect, I will be voting against your confirmation, Your Honor. But Republicans, on the cusp of cementing a 6-3 court majority, gave her rave reviews. This is the first time in American history that we've nominated a woman who's unashamedly pro-life and uh, embraces her faith without apology, and she's going to the court. If confirmed, Barrett will help decide Obamacare's fate this year. Repeatedly at the hearing, she said that the justices may well decide to slice out one part of the law that's already defunct, but keep the rest. But she wouldn't say, Lana, whether she backs that approach. All right. Thank you, Nancy. For more, I want to bring in Jennifer Habercorn and Jessica Levinson. Jennifer is a congressional reporter for the LA Times, and Jessica is a professor at Loyola Law School in Los Angeles. Jessica, during the second round of questioning, Judge Barrett was again pressed on topics such as the Affordable Care Act and the powers of the president. So what are some of your key takeaways from Wednesday's hearing? Yeah, I mean, I think the key takeaway has to be that she's really not giving anything away. And she knows that she has the votes and she knows that she doesn't want to box herself into a corner. And frankly, this is not you know, unique to Judge Barrett. So it's been now for a few decades where a win in a Supreme Court hearing is really just to convey absolutely nothing. It's It's frankly kind of like a circus. We have people who have clearly had opinions all their lives on legal issues, on policy issues, on political issues. They walk into the Senate confirmation hearings, and then the name of the game, the bar for success, is really to say, you know, I don't have any preconceived notions on that. And that's really the way you ensure that you don't have any catastrophic moments in the confirmation hearings. Okay, Jennifer, we've seen senators bring up several hot button topics throughout the hearing, like health care and abortion. With Barrett's confirmation essentially a fade to complete, does it feel like some of the questions are designed really to benefit senators who are in tight races for their own reelections? Oh, completely. I mean, like you said, if this nomination, you know, barring some kind of bombshell, is going to be confirmed. Um, so senators did focus very much on the questions appropriate for a Supreme Court justice, but they were also asking questions with a focus on the 2020 election. I mean, you saw it in uh, the, particularly the senators who are up this cycle, including Tom Tillis from North Carolina, Joni Ernst from Iowa, even Lindsey Graham from South Carolina. All of them are in contested races, and all of them you know, really seem to be framing their questions around what was important to their home states. Um, uh, Joni Ernst spent a significant amount of time talking about issues important to Iowa farmers, and Lindsey Graham talked about a uh, bill to ban abortion at 20 weeks, which has been very important to him in his reelection race. He even, um, you know, during the hearing, made a sarcastic comment about the good old days of white segregation, and uh, his opponent uh, started fundraising off of it and yeah. started making it an issue. Graham responded in real time. So this was, you know, the 2020 election was very much hanging. Uh, in the background of this uh, nomination hearing. Yeah, very interesting, too, to see that Ernst started off um, her her time just 
giving uh, giving Judge Barrett as much time as she wanted to clarify some questions about the Supreme Court. All right, Barrett was also asked by Senator Dick Durbin whether it would be constitutional for the president to unilaterally delay the election. It is, as Congress sets the date for the election. She was then asked um, if the president could unilaterally deny the right to vote based on race or gender. I'm going to play for our viewers some of that exchange. The Constitution contains provisions that prohibit discrimination on the basis of race in voting. But whether a president can unilaterally deny, you're not going to answer yes or no. Well, Senator, you've asked a couple different questions about what the senator, uh, what the president might be able to unilaterally do, and I think that I really can't say anything more than I'm not going to answer hypotheticals. It strains originalism. If the if clear wording of the Constitution establishes a right and you will not acknowledge it. Well, Senator, it would strain the canons of conduct, which don't permit me to offer off-the-cuff reactions or any opinions outside of the judicial decision-making process. So, Jessica, we know she's not trying to make waves. Supreme Court nominees often don't uh, decline to answer questions about hypotheticals. But this one seemed to really perplex Senator Durbin. What did you make of that exchange? Well, what I make of it is that she knows that one of the big issues that's going to come before the Supreme Court increasingly is voting rights. So she's been asked a lot about the Affordable Care Act. And that, of course, as you just discussed, that's a short-term political issue that's very important in the 2020 election. But looking forward, there's going to be a lot of cases dealing with voting rights, religious rights, reproductive rights. With respect to this exchange on voting rights, I mean, in a way, it does make waves in progressive circles because she was so non, um, she really refused to commit in any way to saying, look, the right to vote is fundamental and then X, Y, and Z. And so we know that one of the big cases that the court dealt with recently dealt with uh, voting rights protections under the Voting Rights Act. We'll see more of that. And I, I can't help but think she's laying the groundwork for uh, the continuing dismantling of voting rights protections. I want to stick with you on this for one more moment, because Judge Barrett is also trying to differen differentiate herself from her mentor, the late Justice Antonin Scalia, while also defending her originalist views. How is she doing that, Jessica? Yeah, she's really saying, I'm not going to be a rubber, I'm not going to be, you know, the equivalent of a doppelganger. So I won't be that in every case where you could have predicted how Justice Scalia was going to come out, I'll come out the same way. She's trying to say, I am my own person. I think she's also trying to calm the nerves of people who might be in more of the center of the political spectrum and or the spectrum of legal thought, because Justice Scalia really was the kind of godfather of this idea of originalism, which we could have a long discussion about whether or not it's a real legal theory and whether or not it's anything other than an outcome determinative. But, you know, again, she wants to say, I'm my own judge, but she has to say that because this is part of her narrative of, I can't prejudge anything, and all I'm going to do is what every other judge does. I'm going to apply the facts of a new case to the existing law. We all know Supreme Court judges, of course, excuse, excuse me, Supreme Court justices do far more than that. But she wants to break out of any preconceived notions that she might just be, you know, the new Justice Scalia. All right, Jennifer, a committee vote on Barrett's nomination could happen as soon as Thursday. Democrats have been trying to delay it. It doesn't seem like they have many, um, many options still available to them. Are there any other plays for the Democrats on this? Well, they are going to start the process of a vote on Thursday, but most likely it's going to be delayed a week. That's been tradition that the minority gets to delay the vote in the committee for a week. There's no sign that that won't happen. But other than that, you're right, there's not much else they can do. Um, there's been some discussion of boycotting the vote, um, but I, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, really, the only hand left for uh, Democrats is if a Republican on the committee were in quarantine because of coronavirus or couldn't attend for some reason. Then, um, then Republicans would have a hard time reaching the quorum requirements. 
But as of now, that certainly does not appear to be the case. So, um, you know, Democrats, uh, you know, we've, we've seen in some of their public remarks a bit of uh, a, a tone of rejection that um, they know that if Republicans are able to hang on to their 51 votes that they appear to have right now, this is uh, um, a process that's going to move forward. And Jennifer, I also want to ask you about the ongoing stimulus talks. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin spoke on Wednesday and are expected to talk again on Thursday. Where do things stand on getting a relief package passed before the election? You know, we're 20 days away. At this point, it seems incredibly unlikely that anything comes together before Election Day. And in fact, it, it, it's appeared to be heading in that direction for quite a while now. But the Treasury Secretary today um, really for the first time acknowledged that that seems increasingly impossible to do something before Election Day. Of course, things could change very dramatically and we could see some movement on something. Uh, particularly something small, but the parties are very far apart. Um, the White House and House Democrats are far apart in their negotiations between Mnuchin and Pelosi, but also Senate Republicans are not at all on board with what the White House are, and the president seemingly want to do. So um, with, with all three of those parties being extremely far apart and not really negotiating, it seems almost impossible for something to happen in the next 20 days. Jennifer Haberkorn, Jessica Levinson, always a joy to speak with you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.